Hello and welcome to lesson 14 of 20 in the URSA Campus Breakdown course on Introductory Statistics and Probability. This is Module 3, Random Variables and Probability Distributions, Part 4, Sampling Distributions and the Central Limit Theorem. Let's get started. In this lesson, we extend our examination of random variables to consider the case where the mean of a sample is the random variable of interest. This is a topic that brings the discrete and continuous cases together and via the central limit theorem, it allows us to use the normal distribution even where the underlying probability distribution for a random variable might not be normal. The topics covered in this lesson include sampling distributions, the central limit theorem, and the normal approximation to the binomial distribution. As we have discussed previously, when we look at a population as a whole and are able to conduct a census of it, we can arrive at definite conclusions about various aspects of the population through the use of descriptive statistics. On the other hand, as we have also discussed previously, we are usually unable to access entire populations of interest, and therefore we are limited to collecting samples. And this limits our analyses to being, at the best, educated guesses about the true nature of the overall population. With sampling, in other words, we're at the mercy of random sampling error, even if all of our methods used are unbiased and otherwise correctly applied. So far in this module, we have taken a close look at how random variables can be defined and their parameter values used to calculate probabilities, which, generally speaking, are meant to model relevant questions we may have about the populations they relate to. In this lesson, we examine the nature of samples as randomly selected subsets of populations and how this inherent randomness must be considered measured and interpreted against the wider task of trying to make educated guesses about the populations from which they are taken. Most of the probability distributions we have considered thus far are ones that relate to individuals, randomly selected one at a time from their populations. For example, we recently looked at a random variable x equaling the mass of garbage in kilograms generated by a site visit to a backcountry campsite. Let's now consider the case where a sample of size little n is to be taken from a population. And for now, let's assume that the sample size is very small compared to the overall population size big N. In other words, little n is much smaller than big N. Now, while the population will have some mean value mu for whatever quantity it is we're interested in, for example, the mass of garbage per site visit, we're not certain that the sample we take from the population will yield an equal value for the sample mean x bar. In fact, due to variation within the population, it is generally unlikely that we will end up with a sample where the sample mean exactly equals the population mean. In other words, where x bar equals mu. Put another way, when we take a sample from a population, the resulting statistics for the sample, such as the mean, median, mode, mid-range, or the mean absolute deviation, the MAD, or the standard deviation, or the range, are themselves random variables. In this lesson, we focus on the sample mean, x bar specifically, as a random variable resulting from any sample from a population. In general, for any random variable x with mean equal to mu x and standard deviation equal to sigma x, if a random sample of size little n is taken from a population of size big N, where little n is much smaller than big N, then the sample mean x bar is a random variable with the following parameters. Mu x bar equals mu x, where mu x bar is called the mean of x bar. 
and sigma x bar equals sigma x divided by the square root of n, little n, where sigma x bar is called the standard deviation of x bar. Now, the rule for mu x bar tells us what, 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 what should seem self-evident. In other words, that if we take a random sample from a population, the expected or average value for the sample should equal the expected or average value for the population as a whole. Another way of saying this is that the mean of the sample means equals the population mean. Put another way, any individual sample is likely to have an X bar, a sample mean, that is lesser or greater than the true population mean, mu X. But the tendency for some samples to yield uh, sample means that are less than the population mean will tend on the whole to be balanced out by an equal tendency for other samples to yield um, sample means that are that are greater than the population mean. In other words, the, 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 the sample means that are below average will, will cancel out in the long run with the sample means um, that are above average. And note as well that mu x bar is independent of the sample size little n. You don't see little n in, in the equation for mu x bar as you do with sigma x bar. In other words, sample size has no influence on the expected value of the sample mean. Now the rule for sigma x bar tells us a different story, namely that the dispersion of x bar is a function of the sample size little n with the standard deviation of x bar decreasing as little n increases. Now the reason for this can be explained by considering how extreme values influence the value of x bar for a sample. For a smaller sample, the random presence of any individual extreme value has a proportionally higher impact upon the calculation of x bar and with less chance of an oppositely extreme other individual value being present to, to so to speak, cancel out this deviation. Now, by comparison, in a larger sample, any single individual extreme value has less of an aggregate impact or overall impact. And with more values in the sample, there's a greater chance of finding an oppositely extreme individual value to cancel out this deviation. So these rules for mu x bar and, and sigma x bar are illustrated in the diagram below, which shows how increasing or decreasing the sample size little n influences the shape of the curve of a normally distributed random variable. Now, what we have in the diagram on the slide below is we have three different, three different distributions are shown of different, so these are samples of different sizes and, and the, the blue one, which is the lowest one, that's for the smallest possible sample, uh, which is just a sample size of one, which is really what we've been looking at so far when we pick one individual randomly from a population, we're essentially taking a sample of one. Now, as we increase the sample size, we can see we have the, the red uh, curve is narrower then the blue curve, and then the green curve is even narrower. And, and, and so the red curve is narrower and taller. As the curve gets narrower, it also has to get taller because remember the total area under all the curves has to be equal. They all have to equal one. So as the curves get narrower, they also get taller. So um, from n equals one, we have a larger sample size giving us a red the red curve represented by the red curve and an even larger sample size represented by the green curve. So notice that all three curves, though, are all centered on the same value of mu x. In other words, the expected value or mean of x bar is equal to mu x regardless of sample size. However, as we do change the sample size, we can see that as n increases from 1 upwards, the, distrib the distribution remains normal. So we still see the bell-shaped curve and with that same mean of mu x, but with a narrower and taller distribution about this mean. And that's simply because of the fact that the standard deviation, 
4 x bar, in other words, sigma x bar, is, is equal to sigma x divided by the square root of little n. And as n gets bigger, of course, we're dividing by a larger number, which gives us a smaller standard deviation for x bar. And as that standard deviation gets smaller, our distribution gets now narrower and taller, as we see here in the diagram. One result of increasing the sample size, little n, is that for any fixed value k, the probability that the sample mean, x bar, is within plus or minus k of the population mean, mu x, will increase as little n increases and vice versa. So this can be seen in the diagram below where the area between x bar equals mu x minus k and x bar equals mu x plus k becomes greater as n gets larger. So you can see there's three curves there. And as, as the curves get taller and narrower, uh, as the uh, sample size gets larger, the curves are getting taller and narrower, and therefore more of the total area of one is captured between that fixed range of values between mu x minus k and mu x plus k. For a normally distributed random variable, the calculation of probabilities involves the use of the standard normal distribution as before, except the formula relating x bar values and their corresponding z values is now also a function of the sample size. In other words, z equals x bar minus mu x bar all over sigma x bar, which equals x bar minus mu x over sigma x over root n, which when we rearrange gives us z equals the difference between x bar and mu x times the root of n over sigma x. And rearranging the other formula we get is that x bar equals mu x plus z times sigma x over the square root of n. Notice that for n equals 1, the above formulas reduce to the same ones we used in the previous lesson. This is because the random variables we were looking at then represented normal distributions for random selections of one individual at a time. We'll now look at an example that applies the above formulas. In example one, we go back to the example from the previous lesson where we looked at the mass of garbage left behind by campers at a backcountry back campground where that tended to follow a normal distribution with a mean of 1.75 kilograms and standard deviation of 0.48 kilograms per site visit. What we're asked to do in this example is for each of the sample sizes that you'll see in A, B, and C, we're asked to calculate the following two things. First of all, we're asked to calculate the probability that the average mass of garbage per site visit is less than 1.50 kilograms. And then we're asked to find the mass of garbage in kilograms above which only 1% of sample averages would fall. And the sample sizes that we're going to do this for are in part A, n equals 1, in B, n equals 10, and in C, n equals 100. So to answer this question, we start by defining what our random variable is in this, in this example, in this problem. In this particular problem, the random variable is actually the sample mean, x bar. So we let x bar equal the sample mean mass of garbage in kilograms for a random sample of n site visits. Now, based on what we've discussed in the previous slides, therefore, x bar is a random variable that's distributed normally with a mean of 1.75 and a standard deviation equal to 0.48 divided by whatever the, squ the square root of whatever n is. And so what that will give us for all of the parts of this problem are the following two uh, equations that we can use. The first is that z will equal x bar minus 1.75 all times square root of n divided by 0.48 and We'll also have the equation x bar equals 1.75 plus 0.48 times z divided by the square root of n. Now that we have these formulas, we're ready to answer the questions.
For part A, n equals 1, which makes this problem equivalent to looking at the probability distribution for x, where we're randomly sampling one at a time. So therefore, z equals x bar minus 1.75 all over 0.48, and x bar equals 1.75 plus 0.48 times z. So the answer to the first question is equal to the probability that the average mass of garbage per site visit is less than 1.50 kilograms. That equals the probability that x bar is less than 1.50, which becomes which is equal to the probability that z is less than 1.50 minus 1.75 over 0.48, and that rounds to the probability that z is less than minus 0.52. We can see the diagram on the, the upper diagram shows um, that this is a z value to the left of center. So the answer to this is the area of the left tail, the phi value of, this is equal to the phi value of minus 0.52, which rounds to 0 0.3015 or to the nearest percent 30%. For the second question, we're asked to find the mass of garbage in kilograms above which only 1% of sample averages would fall. So this is a reverse type problem. In the diagram below, we can see that we're looking for the value. We're looking, we, we're looking for, we have an upper tail containing 0 0.01. So the z value that we're, in, that we're looking for has a phi value of 1 minus 0 0.01 or 0.99. Looking that up in the table, we get z uh, rounding to uh, 2.33, and plugging that into our formula for x bar, therefore we get x bar is uh, equal to 1.75 plus 0.48 times 2.33, so that rounds uh, to um, two decimal places to 2.87 kilograms. Now, in part A, we got answers that were basically the same as in the last lesson because our n value was just equal to 1. So essentially, we were just redoing a, a distribution uh, of the random variable x. However, in part B now, we've got an n value larger than 1. We've got n equals 10. So we're going to start to see differences. We need to actually use this new these uh, new equations for uh, related to the distribution of x bar. So we get that z equals... Uh, x bar minus 1.75 times the square root of 10 divided by 0.48 and x bar equals 1.75 plus 0.48 z divided by root 10. So the answer to the first question now becomes the probability that x bar is less than 1.50 is equal to the probability that z is less than 1.50 minus 1.75 times root 10 divided by 0.48. That works out to the probability that z is less than minus 1.65, which means we're now looking for the phi value of minus 1.65, which gives us 0 0.0495, round, rounding to the nearest percent to 5%. And to do the second part of the question, now in order to find, we, we have the same z value of 2.33 that corresponds with a phi value of 0.99, as we saw before. But now we're going to use the new formula for x bar to find what the, the correct value is for x bar. So we plug that in and we get 1.75 plus 0.48 times 2.33 divided by root 10. And that gives us the answer to two decimal places of 2.10 kilograms. In part C, we have n equals 100. So we redo... Essentially, we do the same thing we did in Part B, but we replace n equals 10 with n equals 100. So you can see the new formulas there have the 10 replaced with the 100. And, and by the way, since a hundred, the square root of 100 is a nice round value of 10, we can actually um, do a little bit of mathematical manipulation. You can see that, that the formula for z, it's being rewritten as being equivalent to the x bar minus 1.75 divided by 0 0.048. You don't need to do it that way, but it's a nice little shortcut to do if you can see the, the mathematical relationship there. And similarly, the formula for x bar uh, is equivalent to 1.75 plus 0 0.048z, if you'd like to use that shortcut as well. <clears throat> so this time we get 
that the probability that the answer to the first question is that the probability that x bar is less than 1.50. Uh, we plug in the, the value into the new formula and we get that that's the probability that z is less than minus 5.21. Now, we're looking that, therefore for the phi value for minus 5.21, and notice that our table, you can see in the diagram that that's way out on the left. That's, that's going to give us a very small value there on the, in the left tail there in blue. Now, the table that we use only goes as far back, only goes as far on either side to z equals plus or minus 3.99. And... And the probability to four decimal places that z is less than minus 3.99, that rounds to 0. 0.0000. In other words, to four decimal places, it rounds to zero, which means it's actually it less than 0. 0.00005, so that it's not rounding up to 0. 0.0001. Now, minus 5.21, since it's further to the left, that means that we can conclude that to four decimal places, likewise, the answer is zero, uh, because uh, the phi of minus 5.21 must be less than the phi of minus 3.99. So we can conclude that at least to four decimal places, that the probability that x bar is less than 1.50 is equal to zero percent, certainly to the nearest percent, that also rounds to zero percent. Now in part two, uh, once again, we're trying to find uh, the X bar value that corresponds with the Z value of 2.33. And when we plug it into the new equation for X bar, we get an answer of 1.86 kilograms to two decimal places. So we've answered all the questions and it's worth uh, pointing out here and you can see the diagram on the bottom right of the slide shows how f as we increase the sample size from one to 10 to 100, the cutoff value for the largest 1% <clears throat> of X bar values decreases. In other words, gets closer to mu X, the mu X value, which is 1.75. And that's consistent with what we discussed before about what happens as you increase sample size. So far in this lesson, we have assumed that the populations from which samples are taken are either very large, such that little n is much smaller than big N, or else sampling is done without replacement so that the population is essentially infinite. In the case where there is a finite population, the standard deviation of the sample mean, sigma x bar, is multiplied by what we call a finite population correction factor, which equals the square root of big N minus little n over big N minus one. Now the derivation of this is left for further study beyond this course, but we will use this correction factor wherever we are, have a finite population. And in such a case, the distribution of the sample mean from a population therefore becomes as follows. X, we say that X bar is distributed normally with mean equal to mu X and standard deviation equal to sigma X over the square root of little n times the that correction factor, which is the square root of big N minus little n over big N minus one. And when we substitute that uh, value for the standard deviation of X bar into our previous formula for Z, and we do all the mathematical um, manipulations to simplify it, we end up with the formula that you see on the slide, which is therefore that Z equals X bar minus mu X over sigma X times the square root of little n times big N minus one over big N minus little n. And rearranging that, we get the uh, formula, the revised formula for X bar equaling mu X plus Z times sigma X times the square root of big N minus little n over little n times big N minus one. In example two, we're asked to redo example one, this time assuming that there have been a total of 100 site visits to this backcountry campsite thus far. So to answer this question, we, we start by recognizing that that 100, that's a value for big N, that's our population. So we proceed in the same manner as before, except that now we apply the finite population correction factor. So we, we define X bar as being the sample mean mass of garbage in kilograms for a random sample of N site visits as before. 
So this time, the distribution will be that x bar is distributed normally with a mean of 1.75 and a standard deviation this time of 0.48 divided by root n times the square root of 100 minus n over 99. And that gives us the two key formulas being z equals x bar minus 1.75 over 0.48 times the square root of 99n over 100 minus n and x bar equals 1.75 plus 0.48z times the square root of 100 minus n over 99n. So now we're ready to answer the questions. In part A, we have n equals 1. And when we substitute n equals 1 into the equations, we see that essentially the finite correction factor works out to be the square root of 99 over 99, <clears throat> which just works out to be the square root of 1, which is just 1. In other words, the answers are going to be the same as, for example, 1a, part a of example 1, uh, for an infinite population. So the answers for these questions is that the average mass of garbage per site visit being less than 1.50 kilograms uh, is to the nearest percent, 30 percent, and that the mass of garbage in kilograms above which only 1 percent of sample averages would fall is uh, to two decimal places equal to 2.87 kilograms. In part B, now we have an n value larger than 1, so we're going to see the impact of the finite uh, population correction factor. So for n equals 10, we end up with the correction factor equaling the square root of 90 over 990. And when we substitute that uh, information in, into all, when we substitute the value of n equals 10 into our formulas for z and x bar, you see on the slide the resulting formulas. When we go to work out the probability that x bar is less than 1.50, we get that that equals the probability that z is less than minus 1.73, which works out to equal 0 0.0418, which rounds to 4%. And note that's 4% versus the 5% uh, answer that we got for the infinite population. In the second part, uh, the mass of garbage in kilograms above which only 1% of sample averages would fall. Now, <clears throat> using the correction factor and plugging in the z value of 2.33 that corresponds to, to this situation as before, uh, we plug the 2.33 into the new equation for x bar and we end up with an answer to two decimal places of 2.09 kilograms and note that that's versus 2.10 kilograms for the infinite population. In part C <clears throat> we're looking at the largest sample size here of 100 and when we put in 100 what we see happening is now What's happening here, of course, is that the, the value for little n equals 100, that is the population. That is, that is the equal to big N, which is 100. So you'll see that what we end up with here is our correction factor, our finite population correction factor works out to be zero. And what that does is it, we, we actually have to be careful here because the formula for x bar is fine because we just end up timesing our standard, we just end up um, timesing 0.48z by zero, uh, which basically just means that x bar simply equals 1.75 period. We actually mathematically uh, have a problem with putting this result into the formula for z because we end up multiplying by the square root of 9 of 9900 over 0 and of course you when you divide by 0 that's undefined what we have to do in this situation there actually isn't a problem we simply recognize that something special is going on here and what that is is since our sample size is equal to the population size this is actually a census now remember when we do a census x bar will always equal mu x. In other words, since the entire population is being sampled, the sample mean must equal the population mean with no uncertainty. So in other words, this is just another reminder for us of what happens when we do a census, i.e. The, the sigma x bar will equal zero in this situation. And this is manifest in the value of the finite population correction factor 
when little n equals big N. Because in general, if we let little n equal to, large, to big N and we substitute that into the formula for the correction factor, we'll always get 0 over big N minus 1. In other words, we'll always get a correction factor value of 0, which means that our standard deviation, sigma x bar, is always going to equal 0. So what that means in terms of the answers to the questions are as follows. It means that the probability that the average mass of garbage per site visit is less than 1.50 kilograms has to equal zero because remember that the population mean is 1.75 kilograms. So our X bar will, will certainly with 100% certainty equal 1.75 kilograms. Now it just so happens that this question is asking for the probability uh, that the average mass is below is less than 1.5. And since 1.5 is, is already less than 1.75, we know that this is impossible. So the answer is zero. Uh, just, just, um, just for further information, uh, for the sake of, of, of sort of completeness here, it's worth mentioning that if, uh, the, if the question it asks is to find the probability that the average mass of garbage per site visit um, that, that from that sample um, was greater than 1.50 kilograms, we would actually say the answer was 1 because the, the certain sample mean of 1.75 is greater than 1.50. So then the answer would have been 1. So what basically is happening in a situation like this is that when we do a census, there's no more uncertainty. And so the answers to questions like these end up either being 0 or 1, depending on what we're asking. Now, the second part of this asks for the mass of garbage in kilograms above which only 1% of sample averages would fall. This, the answer to this question actually becomes undefined because, again, if we're doing a census, all the sample averages of, for samples of this size will be exactly equal to mu x, which is 1.75 kilograms. So there is no, there's no, there's no more relevant meaning to. Uh, the idea of a, a some other value of garbage above which only 1% of sample averages would fall. So we simply say the answer is undefined because all sample averages would, would equal exactly 1.75 kilograms. So the extreme case of a census with respect to the distribution of a sample mean, it, it's, 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 it's definitely a very, a very special case. And it's illustrated in the diagram on below on the bottom of the slide. With, where you see you have these the bell curves or the number of bell curves and you see that as as the uh, sample size little n is increasing the bell curves become taller or taller and taller and narrower and narrower so in the extreme case where we do a census where where little n equals big n the the bell curve reduces to to a discrete spike it just becomes this the the, the vertical line at x bar equals mu x. And then, of course, the probability of x bar equaling mu x becomes 1. In the previous examples, we were able to calculate probabilities associated with the means of samples taken from a normal population. Because the distribution of x bar from such a population also has a normal distribution. However, as we have seen already throughout this course, many random variables are not normally distributed, including those with no theoretical distribution at all, for which we are not able to calculate an exact distribution for x bar. Does this mean that we are unable to calculate probabilities associated with x bar as we were able to in the normal case? Well, the answer, fortunately, is that we are able to estimate such probabilities and to a relatively high degree of accuracy, via one of the most important principles found in statistics, and that's called the central limit theorem. And we'll use the, uh, the short form of CLT um, as a shorthand for the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem states the following about any random variable x. Firstly, it says that if x is a normal random variable with mean of mu x and standard deviation of sigma x, then the sample mean x bar for any sample will also be a normal random variable and it will be distributed with mean of mu x and standard deviation of sigma x over the square root of n. Now, the second part of the central limit theorem states that when x is not normally distributed, that in general, 
as the sample size n increases, the random variable x bar will more and more approach and become more like a normal random variable with mean of mu x and standard deviation of sigma x over root n. Now the second part of this says that when n is sufficiently large, we can we can simply just use uh, make the assumption that x bar is distributed normally, and we can we can use the normal distribution of of with mean of mu x and standard deviation of sigma x over root n as a reasonable approximation for the true distribution of x bar. Now we've already applied the first part of the central limit theorem uh, in this lesson, uh, namely that the distribution of the mean for a sample from a normal population will also be normal. And of course, this allows us to use the Z table to calculate probabilities about such sampling distributions. Now, it is the second part of the central limit theorem that represents a very important and useful fundamental principle of statistics. This is really one of the most important theorems in statistics. And what it, what it states basically is that even non-normal random variables have sampling distributions that approach normal as the sample size n increases. And furthermore, if the sample size is large enough, the normal distribution can be used as an accurate means of estimating probabilities associated with x bar. So this is very important and useful for us. Now the mathematical proof of the central limit theorem is left for further study beyond this course. However, the central limit theorem itself is very important within this course as it essentially allows us to use the normal distribution to calculate probabilities related to sample means, x bar, for random variables with any type of underlying probability distribution, particularly and this is particularly useful for those that are derived empirically, where we don't have any theoretical distribution at all, normal or otherwise, where we, for which there's no exact means for analyzing the sampling distributions mathematically otherwise. So the central limit theorem allows us to use one uh, sort of family of distributions, the normal distribution, um, to analyze uh, random variables, sample means from random variables of all types. In example three, we apply the central limit theorem uh, to an example with a random spinner similar to what we've talked about before. So it's kind of like a little arrow uh, device that we spin and we assume that where it stops, uh, the direction it's pointing where it stops is um, random. And actually it would be, we assume that it's a uniform continuous distribution. And so we can define the random variable X equals the clockwise angle from true north on um, that the spinner is pointing to when it stops. And so that will be values between zero and 360 degrees. So you can see the diagram on the slide. What it shows here is the actual probability distributions for X bar, which would be the average angle we would get in a sample of size n and there's there's four different sample sizes shown here now when n equals one re remember that when n equals one the distribution of x bar is going to be the same as the as the base distribution for x because that is essentially what x is defined as it's the distribution of one at a time so a sample size of one x bar is just going to be distributed like like x so we so we can see that we get a uniform continuous distribution. And that's the horizontal line. And then the vertical, and we see that overall we have the rectangle shape enclosing the total area of one. And, and the reason of this again is because the result of one spin has that uniform probability across all values between zero degrees and 360 degrees. Now, as soon as the sample contains more than one spin, in other words, as soon as N is larger than one, we start to see this averaging out of values below and above mu x, which is 180 degrees. Now, right, the average value uh, of where uh, the spinner would stop is simply going to be the halfway point between 0 and 360, which is the 180 degrees. Now, if you only spin once, the every, every uh, sample mean uh, is equally likely, and that's why we get the horizontal line for n equals 1. However, as soon as you have more than one, 
we, we can see the change in the shapes and you can see the shapes in the graphs change from being a rectangle to a triangle to then starting to have that that more classic bell shape so we can see that immediately as soon as we have n equals 2 the the pdf of x bar is no longer uniform and instead it's peaked at x bar equals the mu x value of 180 degrees now as n increases the pdf uh, of x bar starts to take on an increasingly normal form. And we can see that here. Um, from, from n equals 1 to n equals 2, we go from a rectangle shape to a triangle shape. And then as soon as we're, and, and that's still linear, but now a triangle instead of a rectangle. And then we can see that as soon as we go beyond 2, we can see that uh, in the example shown for n equals 4 and n equals 8, we're getting that we're starting to see that nonlinear and classic bell shaped. And what's happening is, we can see uh, that, uh, and this is and this is the central limit theorem in action. We can see visually here the manifestation of the central limit theorem, which is that as the sample size gets larger, the distribution of x bar becomes more and more normal. Now, note that even as n increases, the distribution of x bar remains bounded between 0 and 360 degrees in this particular case, because the spinner can only have angles between 0 and 360. It's bounded on both ends. While a truly normal random variable is unbounded on both sides, remember we, we discussed previously that um, theoretically a normal random variable um, takes on all real values from negative infinity to infinity. So this is a reminder here that the PDF of x bar never exactly becomes normal, because if it did, it would actually allow values that were, on, were less than 0 and greater than 360 degrees. Rather, what we're seeing is that it converges to a better and better approximation of a normal distribution. So it's really important to understand that the central limit theorem doesn't tell us that random variable, the, the distribution of sample means becomes that they become normal, period, uh, as n gets larger. But rather, it's just that the larger the sample size, the more like a normal distribution the distribution of x bar becomes. And we can see here that as n gets larger, not only are the graphs becoming more and more like a, a normal uh, bell curve, they're also becoming narrower and narrower because the larger your sample size, the more the extreme values that are higher, far away from 180 on the higher and lower ends, the more there, the more values there are in the sample to cancel each other out so that you're much, much more likely as the sample size increases to get a sample mean that's very close to that central value of mu x, which is uh, in this case 180 degrees. The central limit theorem applies likewise to random variables that are not only non-normal, but are also also includes discrete instead of continuous and or asymmetrical instead of symmetrical distributions. Now, in the previous example, we apply the central limit theorem to the the uniform continuous case, uh, which happens to be still continuous, although it's not normal, it's still continuous and it's still symmetrical. Um, the idea here is that the central limit theorem can actually be used for, for all kinds of distributions. They don't have to be continuous, they can be discrete, and they don't have to be symmetrical, they can be asymmetrical. So for example, if we have a, a biased six-sided die, it'll have a discrete distribution in terms of the probability that the die lands on any of the particular uh, values, but it'll be non-uniform if it's not a fair die, if it's biased. So it would be non-normal for both of those reasons, the base distribution of, that, of, the, uh, of the outcome from that six-sided die. However, if we have large enough sample sizes, the distribution of the average outcome, the distribution of x, x bar will, as per the central limit theorem, still tend towards normality enough so that the normal distribution can be used to model it. And similarly, you, if you have a continuous but highly non-bell shaped distribution, that will eventually yield a sufficiently normal distribution for x bar if n is large enough. 
this general universality of the central limit theorem is summarized in the diagram that you see below. And so you see there's two um, examples shown that are circled. The one on the left is an example of a discrete non-uniform distribution. And that could be, for example, uh, for a die um, where, where you can see there's only five bars there. Maybe one of the sides of the die, it's loaded so that it's virtually impossible for the die to land on that one side. So that could, that, that graph you see, uh, would be a reasonable um, example of what a what a what a bias die might look like with its probability distribution, and then the one on the right um, that's the graph circled on the right shows that's a continuous distribution and, and it looks somewhat bell shaped except it's got two bell shaped sections which which is not the definition of a normal distribution which is only a single uh, bell shape and and there's there's no symmet there's asymmetry in that in that particular distribution because uh, the bell shape on the right is contains more area than the bell shape on the left. The, the right and left portions of those that single distribution, it's unbalanced. So those are both examples of um, distributions that are not normal. And then the diagram is showing how as, as the sample size gets larger and larger, the, the distribution not of, now you see those graphs above that are circled, those are distributions of probability um, for x, the random variable x, whereas in the graph below, that's a that's a, a bell-shaped looking graph, we see that the random variable here is x bar. So the point of the diagram, which is the point of the central limit theorem, is that even if the base random variable x is not normally distributed and may be far from being normally distributed like the examples shown here, the distribution of x bar, the sample mean, will become more and more like a normal distribution as n gets larger. A final point about the central limit theorem addresses the question of how large a value of n is what we call large enough, because you've, you've, you've probably noticed this, this use of the terminology when x is large enough. So a final point here in the central limit theorem addresses just how large a value is large enough for the normal distribution to be accurate enough an approximation for non-normal random variables. Now, unfortunately, there's no single answer to this question. Uh, in other words, there isn't just a single value of n uh, that uh, up at or above which we can say that the central limit theorem can be invoked. What we can say, um, Otherwise, is that the clo and, and this is really the sort of rule of thumb that we use here in general, and that is that the closer the, to normal the distribution of the base random variable x is, then the lower the value of n is at which the normal approximation is close enough. In other words, the more normal, the more bell-shaped the the random variable in question is, then the lower we need the sample size to be in order to be able to reasonably apply the central limit theorem. So a symmetrical distribution with probability concentrated around its mean, in other words, similar to a bell-shaped distribution, that may only require a sample as small as n equals 10 or even less. While on the other extreme, if you have a highly asymmetrical distribution, that might require n equals 50 or even greater. Now, we will more generally, however, for the sake of this course, to keep things simple, we'll use a commonly used rule of thumb, which states that the central limit theorem can be applied for sample sizes of around n greater or equal to 30. But do keep in mind that that's a very, very general rule of thumb, and for the reasons explained previously above here in the slide, um, that is a very, very, very general rule of thumb. Now, for the purposes of this course, we're going to restrict our central limit theorem focus to questions or problems where it is assumed that n is sufficiently large enough for the central limit theorem to give us reasonable estimates of calculations about x bar. So we can go on the assumption for the remainder of this course that if it's a problem that is asking us to invoke the central limit theorem, we assume that uh, we, we have a large enough sample size in order to, to reasonably do so. So we'll now look at an example where the central limit theorem is applied in this way. In example four, 
we have historical data that has been collected from residents in a gated community. And we're looking at the probability distribution of the random variable X, was, which is defined as the number of days per week that a resident from this community goes outside the gates on foot. So the, the historical data is summarized in the table that you see below. So if X is defined as the number of days per week that a resident goes outside the gates on foot, then we can see this is a discrete probability distribution where the possible values of X are anywhere from a minimum of zero up through seven, including seven, which is the total number of days in a week. And then in the table, we see like four discrete distributions in general, we see the probabilities for each value, and then they add up to one. And those probabilities uh, are based on just the data that's this empirical data that's being collected historically. So we're asked to do the following in this question. First in part A, we're, we're, we're we're told to assume that the population is very large compared to the sample size. And then we're asked to calculate two things. First, the, the probability that if a random sample of 40 residents from this community is taken, that the sample mean, the number of days per week that residents venture outside the gates on foot, would be greater than or equal to three days per week. And then the second thing we're asked to calculate is, if samples of 40 people from the population were repeatedly <coughs> taken, what would be the sample mean below which only 5% of samples would fall? And in part B, we're asked to redo part A, this time with a population of 238 people uh, as a total population of the gated community. So in this case, we have a random variable that's discrete, which is not a normal characteristic. And furthermore, if you look at the table, you can see that the distribution of the empirical probabilities is rather asymmetrical, which is also a non-normal characteristic. However, we have a sample size of 40, which is greater than 30. So we use that rule of thumb to invoke the central limit theorem. And so what we get is that uh, X bar is distributed can be assumed to be distributed reasonably normally. Now there's two scenarios to look at. One is if we have an infinite population or if the sample size is, is significantly smaller than the population size, we can use the formula as we used before that um, the the, that X bar is distributed normally with mean equal to um, mu X and standard deviation equal to sigma X divided by the square root of the sample size, which in this case is 40. Now, if we have a finite population, we then use that finite population correction factor. So X bar would be distributed normally with um, mean equal to mu x and standard deviation equal to sigma x divided by the square root of 40 times the square root of uh, big N, the population, minus 40 divided by big N minus 1. So the next step is to calculate mu x and sigma x using the probability distribution table. So we calculate um, these as we've done before. So mu x is the expected value of x, which is for a discrete random variable, the sum product of the x values times their corresponding probabilities. And we see the calculation there gives us an exact answer of 2.44. And uh, sigma, for sigma x, we use the shortcut formula. So it's the square root of the difference between the expected value of x squared and the square of the expected value of x. So for that, we add the x squared column as we've done in the past and we square all the x values and then we uh, that will then equal the square root of and then we take the sum product of the x squared values times the corresponding probabilities and we subtract the square of the expected value that we just calculated, the 2.44. So that works out. Now in this case, uh, as is often the case when we have square roots, we have to round this, uh, we have an answer that we need to round. Now, when we're using the uh, normal distribution as we are with these questions, we're going to be using the uh, normal uh, table. And the normal table, uh, if you'll recall, the probabilities inside are given um, 
to up to four, well, there's four decimal places, which means that the answers for probabilities have up to four significant digits. So to be consistent with that, the practice that we'll use here is uh, where necessary, we'll round to four significant digits to be con just to be consistent with that. So using that general approach, which will give us reasonable uh, precision for our answers. Of course, it's, it's, it's certainly always better to use more significant digits if you want to carry them. But um, if we can carry at least four significant digits, we'll have reasonable um, accuracy in our answers. So we round this answer to four significant digits. We get 2.688. So we're now ready to answer the questions. In part A, we invoke the central limit theorem, and so we, we assume that the sample mean x bar is distributed approximately normally with mean of 2.44 and standard deviation that we calculate now to be 2.688 divided by the square root of 40 and to four decimal places, uh, to four significant digits, we round to 0 0.4250. So that allows us to set up our equations for z and x bar as you see on the slide and so now we can go ahead and answer the questions so the probability that if we have a random sample of 40 residents from this community that the sample mean would be greater or equal to 3 so that is going to equal the probability that x bar is greater or equal to 3 and then we substitute that value into our equation for z, and that works out to be the probability that z is greater or equal to 1.32. Again, z value, we round to two decimal places because that's how we look it up in the table. And you see the diagram on the slide shows what that represents. We're looking for one minus the phi value for 1.32 then. So that becomes one minus 0 0.9066 which gives us 0 0.0934, which rounds to the nearest percent to 9%. And the second question asks, if a samples of 40 people were repeatedly taken, th the sample mean below which only 5% of samples would fall. So what we're looking for here is a cutoff value for X bar below which only 5% of X bars that we would get would um, would fall. In other words, if you can see on the graph to the lower right, what we're looking for is a value, and we see that in terms of z because we use the table to look up the z value first. So we start by looking for a z value that gives us an area of 0 0.05 to the left. That gives us minus 1.645. So we substitute that into our equation for x bar, and we get an answer. And we round here, uh, we'll use a general rule of thumb, since the base data is in to the nearest whole number, we'll round to one extra decimal place. So that gives us uh, an answer of 1.7 days per week. For part B, with a finite population of big N equals 238, we get that the distribution of X bar using the finite correction factor. We get x bar is distributed normally with mu x bar equal to 2.44 and mu and sigma x bar rounding to 2.688 over root 40 times the root of 238 minus 40 over 238 minus 1, all of which rounds to four sig figs to 0 0.3885. So therefore our key formulas become z is approximately equal to x bar minus 2.44 over 0.3885 and x bar is approximately equal to 2.44 plus 0.3885. So to answer the questions for the first part, the probability if a random sample of 40 residents from this community is taken that the sample mean number of days per week that residents venture outside the gates on foot would be greater than or equal to three is equal to the probability that x bar is greater or equal to 3, which rounds to the probability that z is greater or equal to 3 minus 2.44 over 0.3885, which rounds to the probability that z is greater or equal to 1.44, and that works out to 1 minus 0.9251, which rounds to 0 0.0749 
or to the nearest percent, 7%. And for the second part, if samples of 40 people from the population were repeatedly taken, the sample mean below which only 5% of samples would fall is still equal to uh, X bar where phi of Z equals 0 0.05, or in other words, we're looking for the Z value uh, where we use the Z value approximately minus 1.645, which plugging into our formula for X bar gives us 2.44 plus 0.3885 times minus 1.645, which rounds to 1.8 days per week. Thus far, we have co considered how the central limit theorem relates to sampling distributions of quantitative data which can be obtained through measurement, for example, in units of meters, seconds, kilograms, etc., and for which we can calculate sample means X bar. The CLT, however, can also be applied to either or data, which is more qualitative in nature. If an experiment is conducted in which independent, identically run trials are repeated, and each trial results in either a success or a failure, then we can define a relevant random variable as follows. We let y equal either 1 if we have a success or 0 if a failure. This type of experiment, as we have seen previously in part 2 of this module, is a binomial one. For n repeated trials, generating a series of random variables yi such as defined above, the sum of these variables would be the sum of from i equals 1 to n of yi, in other words, which equals y1 plus y2 plus dot 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 and so on all the way up to plus yn. And we can let that equal to x, which is equal to the number of successes out of n trials as defined previously. Furthermore, we get that y bar, which is the average of the yi's, equals the sum of the yi's divided by n, which therefore equals x over n, which equals what we call p bar, which is the sample proportion from a binomial population where the probability of success on each trial equals p. In other words, where the mean value mu p bar equals p, the population p. Invoking the central limit theorem, therefore, we can say that for a sufficiently large sample size n, that p bar is distributed approximately normally with mean mu p bar equal to p and sigma p bar equal to the square root of p times 1 minus p over n. And then that would give us, therefore, formulas for z and p bar as follows. z equals p bar minus p divided by the square root of p times 1 minus p over n, and p bar equals p plus z times the square root of p times 1 minus p over n. And if x is defined as the number of successes out of n trials, the central limit theorem also lets us say, therefore, that x is distributed approximately normally with a mean value equal to n times p and the standard deviation equal to the square root of n times p times 1 minus p, which gives us formulas for z and x, where z equals x minus np over the square root of np times 1 minus p, and x equals np plus z times the square root of np times 1 minus p. The latter application of the central limit theorem here to x equals the number of successes out of n independent trials, this latter application that we just mentioned, is an important one commonly referred to as the normal approximation to the binomial distribution. In example five, we see graphs that illustrate the normal approximation to the binomial distribution. And in effect, it's a smoothing out of the binomial distribution's discrete histogram, which is made up of rectangles, one rectangle for each value of each of the discrete random variable x. And we see how the normal distribution's continuous bell curve is fit over top. Now, the graphs we see here 
are all for p equal 0 0.5 and the different graphs show the, the um, different value increasing values of n we start starting with n equals 4 which is rather small and then going up to 10 and then 25 and then 100 and the graphs pretty clearly illustrate you should see you should be able to see how as n increases the binomial histograms which are in blue increasingly resemble the bell-shaped normal curves which are superimposed in red the preceding graphs are all for the case where p equals 0 0.5 which makes the histogram symmetrical like the normal curve as the value of p moves away from 0 0.5 i.e. the closer p is to either 0 or 1, the less normal the histogram becomes because of the lack of symmetry. However, even such an asymmetrical distribution eventually begins to take on a highly normal and symmetrical looking overall shape if, if n is large enough. Example 6 illustrates this with graphs that, show, that are all for the case where p equals 0 0.1 for n values increasing from 4 to 100. And you see that the first graph where n equals 4, um, the, the shape of the histogram is, is, is not, not really at all uh, looking uh, like a, a bell-shaped or normal curve. But as n increases towards 100, you can see that we start to get that very distinctive bell curved shape. As a general rule of thumb that we'll use in this course, the normal approximation to the binomial distribution is considered appropriate so long as both np and n times 1 minus p are greater or equal to 5. The correct application of the normal approximation to the binomial distribution requires that a, continu a continuity correction be made in order to convert histogram areas into their corresponding areas under the bell-shaped curve. In example seven, we consider the example of a binomial distribution where n equals 25 and p equals 0 0.5, where, we're, where we are interested in calculating the probability that x is greater than or equal to 11 and less than or equal to 15. So we see the diagram for this below on the slide. And you can see that the histogram contains rectangles starting at um, zero and going all the way to 25. The histogram rectangles included in this area are those from x equals 11 to x equals 15 inclusive. However, the values for each rectangle correspond to the center of the rectangle. What this means therefore is that the first rectangle for x equals 11 actually begins at x equals 10.5 because that rectangle goes from 10.5 to 11.5 with 11 in the middle. And similarly, the last rectangle for x equals 15 actually ends at x equals 15.5 because it starts at 14.5 and ends at 15.5 with 15 in the middle. In other words, the probability that n, that x is greater or equal to 11 and less than or equal to 15 in the binomial case it can be can be seen as being approximately equal to the normal probability between not 11 and 15 but rather 10.5 and 15.5 and you see that colored in yellow on the on the on the diagram above on the slide in general Calculation of probabilities for the normal approximation to the binomial distribution when we incorporate the, the continuity correction are as follows. Generally speaking, if we're looking for the probability that x is greater than or equal to a and less than or equal to b, as a, in a, at, with x being a binomial random variable, can, can be approximated as equal to the probability that x is greater than or equal to a minus 0 0.5 and less than or equal to B plus 0 0.5 as a normal random variable. In example 8, we go back to the example from the previous lesson uh, where the mass of garbage left behind per site visit at a backcountry campground follows a normal distribution with a mean of 1.75 kilograms and a standard deviation of 0 0.48 kilograms. We're going to estimate here to the nearest percent the probability that in the next 1,000 site visits, 
between 50 and 70 of them inclusive will produce less than one kilogram of garbage. So to answer this question, we start by defining a random variable x, which equals the number of site visits out of a thousand that generates that generate less than 1.00 kilograms of garbage. Now, this is a binomial random variable because we have n equals a thousand and little p equals the probability that a randomly selected site visit produces less than 1.00 kilograms of garbage. That equals 0 0.0594 rounded to four decimal places as we previously calculated. So therefore, we can say that x is distributed binomially with n equals 1,000 and p equals 0 0.0594. And so we can say that the probability distribution function for x using the binomial formula equals 1000 choose x times 0 0.0594 to the power x times 0 0.9406 to the power of 1000 minus x. So therefore, the answer to the question, which is the probability that between 50 and 70 of the next 1000 site visits will produce less than one kilogram of garbage is equal to the probability that x is greater or equal to 50 and less than or equal to 70. Now, there are two separate challenges associated with calculating this probability, which is the probability that x is between 50 and 70. First of all, this requires us to make 21 separate calculations uh, from the binomial formula from 50 through 70 inclusive. And, and so we would have to actually use that binomial P, uh, PDF equation 21 times and then add the results, which is quite a lot of work. The second and actually probably more often larger, more significant problem is that if a calculator is being used, which you might typically be using for a question like this, it's possible that the calculator you're using will not have sufficient operating capacity to compute 1000 choose x for for many of these values of x since the factorial numbers that are generated are actually too large for the calculator storage now while both of the above problems can be overcome the former uh, with mere patience just doing the 21 calculations and the latter via alternative calculations and more patience it's much simpler to use the normal approximation to the binomial distribution. So here's what we do. First, we check that the conditions of the rule of thumb are met for the normal approximation. Now, in this case, uh, n times p would be 1,000 times 0 0.0594, which gives us 59.4, which of course is greater than five. And then n times one minus p will be 1,000 times 0 0.9406, which equals 946, 940.6, which is even greater than five, uh, much greater than five. Now notice that the uh, between NP and N1 minus P, it'll always be the one for the smaller value between P and one minus P that gives us the smaller and therefore more critical value. So in this case, uh, P is less than 0.5. So that when P is less than 0.5, P is the critical value. And when P is greater than 0.5, it's actually one minus P that's less than 0.5 and therefore the critical value. So the one that was of particular interest here was n times p, but that worked out to 59.4, which is far greater than five. So we're actually fine on the rule of thumb. So what that means is that we're sort of clear to go ahead and use the normal approximation. And what that actually means is that the normal approximation, we can expect that the, ans any, that the answer we get will be, will be reasonable and quite close to the exact answer that we would get using the binomial uh, distribution. So we go ahead and we say, therefore, that x is distributed normally with a mean equal to NP, which we've just calculated above as 59.4, and a standard deviation equal to the square root of N times P times 1 minus P. So that'll be the square root of 1,000 times 0 0.0594 times 0 0.9406. And all that works out and rounds to 7.475. So we use, and that's the four significant digits. So then we get the uh, the Z and X formulas are Z equals X minus 59.4 divided by 7.475.
and if we were going to use it, we would the if we were going to need a formula for x, it would x would equal 59.4 plus 7.475z. Now to answer this particular question we've been asked, we use the formula for z, and we make sure that we apply the continuity correction. So that goes as follows. Remember, we're trying to find the probability that x is between 50 and 70 as a binomial random variable. So we apply the, correct, the continuity correction by rounding the lower value of 50 down by a half to 49.5, and then the upper value of 70 up by 0.5 to 70.5. So that will approximately equal the normal probability that x is, is between 49.5 and 70.5, and we plug those values into the equation we developed for z. And we see that we end up with this equaling the probability that z is between minus 1.32 and 1.48. And so we simply subtract the phi value. Um, we, sub we, we simply go uh, the phi value of 1.48 minus the phi value of minus 1.32. So we get 0 0.9306 minus 0 0.0934, which works out to 0.8372, which to the nearest percent is 84%. The following is a set of practice questions meant to provide a review of the material covered in this lesson. Question one. In part one of this module, we looked at the example of a casino roulette wheel game where the PDX for the random variable X equal the net result to player from one play is as follows. And we see the table with the two outcomes, win and lose, and the X values corresponding to that are plus one and minus one and the probabilities respectively are 10 over 21 and 11 over 21. And we're asked to do the following. Part A, calculate the probability that if a person plays this game 500 times, their net result would be to break even or come out ahead. Part B, if this game is played 500 times, what is the overall average result per play, below which only 10% of similar samples of 500 plays would fall? Part C, if a player plays the game 500 times and gets the result from B, what is their overall net result? Part D, redo part A, where the person plays 1,000 games instead of 500. And finally, part E, based on your answers for parts A and D, comment on the veracity of the statement that, quote, playing more times will increase your chance of winning at this game, unquote. We start by defining our random variable of interest. We let x bar equal the average result per play from a random sample of 500 plays of this game. So as per the CLT, x bar will be approximately distributed normally. And our mean of our mu x bar will just equal mu x, which is equal to, and we'll recalculate this here to four sig figs. It's the sum of x times the probability, the probability, it's the sum of the x values times their probabilities, which equals 1 times 10 over 21 minus 1 times 11 over 21, which equals minus 121, which rounds to minus 0 0.04762. So that is our uh, mu x bar. To get our, our sigma x bar, we'll recalculate first sigma x using the shortcut formula. So that is the sum of the squares of x times the probabilities. And from that, we minus the square of uh, mu x. And that equals the root of 1 times 10 over 21 plus 1 times 11 over 21 minus the square of minus 1 over 21, which after arithmetic simplification works out to the root of 440 over 441. So if we put that into the formula for sigma x bar, we end up with the square root of 440 over 441 times 500, and that rounds to four sig figs to 0 0.04467. So therefore, z is equal to x bar plus 0 0.04762 over 0 0.04467, and x bar is equal to minus 0 0.04762 plus 0 0.04467z. Now we can start answering the, the various parts of the question. So for part A, the probability that if a person plays this game 500 times, 
their net result would be to break even or come out ahead. That equals the probability that X bar is greater or equal to zero, which is equal to the probability that Z is greater or equal to zero minus uh, negative, so the same as plus 0 0.04762 divided by 0 0.04467, which gives us the, the probability that Z is greater or equal to 1.07. And you see the diagram here showing the, the Z value on the right side of the middle. Uh, we're looking for the area to the right of that. So we go 1 minus the phi value for 1.07, which gives us 1, point, uh, 1 minus 0 0.8577, which rounds to 0 0.1423, which um, to the nearest percent rounds to um, 14%. For part B, if this game is played 500 times, the overall average result per play below which only 10% of similar samples of 500 plays would fall, is the same as X bar where the phi of Z is equal to 0 0.10. In other words, we can see in the diagram below a bell curve and we're looking for a cutoff value uh, below which we have 10% or 0.1. So we look that up in the, in the Z table and we get Z is approximately minus 1.28. So putting that into our formula for X bar, we get minus 0 0.04762 plus 0 0.04467 times minus 1.28, which rounds to minus 0 0.1048 or to three sig figs minus 0 0.105 dollars. For part C, the result from part B is that X bar is approximately equal to minus $0.1048 per play. Since it's, this is the average for 500 plays, then the overall net result for the player should equal that amount, which is the, the net result per play times the number of plays, which is 500. So we simply multiply by 500 and we get to the nearest cent, we get minus $52.40. In other words, uh, the, the overall net result, the expected net result, is a loss of $52.40. For part D, we, are, we redo A this time with N equals 1,000 instead of 500. So our distribution for X bar remains the same in that it's approximately normally distrib distributed. We have the same mu X bar equal to minus 0.04762 but we revise our sigma x bar accordingly, it will equal the root of 440 over 441 times 1,000, and that rounds to 0 0.03159, which gives us, therefore, z is equal to x bar plus 0 0.04762 divided by 0 0.03159, and that's the only equation we'll need here. So therefore, the probability that a player breaks even or comes out ahead is equal to the probability that X bar is greater or equal to zero, which equals the probability that Z is greater or equal to zero plus 0 0.04762 over 0 0.03159, which rounds to probability that Z is greater or equal to 1.51. So that equals one minus the five for 1.51 which equals 1 minus 0 0.9345, which rounds to 0 0.0655, or to the nearest percent, 7%. For part E, by increasing the number of plays from 500 to 1,000, the probability of winning drops from 14% to 7%, as we've seen here in the previous parts of the question. This demonstrates how, as per the central limit theorem, the chance of winning overall at a losing game actually decreases as the number of plays increases. Therefore, the advice that, quote, playing more times will increase your chance of winning at this game, unquote, runs counter to the truth. Question two. The historical seed germination rate for a certain variety of tomato seeds is 86%. Based on this historical data, 
do the following. Part A, calculate the probability that a sowing of 50 of these seeds will yield 43 sprouted plants using the binomial distribution. Part B, verify that the normal approximation is appropriate in this case, then use this method to redo your calculation for Part A. Part C, calculate the probability that a sowing of 100 of these seeds will yield fewer than 80 sprouts. And finally, Part D, Calculate the probability that a sowing of 1,000 of these seeds will yield fewer than 80 sprouts. For part A, we let x equal the number of tomato seeds that germinate out of 50 sowed. Now, this is a, a binomial random variable. Uh, x is a binomial random variable with mean uh, n equals 50 and p equals 0.86. So therefore, the probability distribution function for x equals 50 choose x times 0.86 to the x times 0.14 to the 50 minus x. So therefore, the probability of getting 43 seeds exactly that germinate equals probability that x equals 43, which equals 50 choose 43 times 0.86 to the 43 times 0.14 to the 7 which rounds to 0 0.1606 or to the nearest percent, 16%. For part B, if we're to use the normal approximation to the binomial, we need to first verify that we meet the conditions of the rule of thumb. That is that both NP and N1 minus P are greater or equal to five. Now, since P is equal to 0.86, which is larger than 0.5, it's going to be 1, 1 minus p that's the smaller that's smaller than p and therefore it's the n times 1 minus p that's going to be the, de the critical or determining value here. So we work that out 50 times 0.14 equals 7 which is greater than 5 so we're good for the uh, approximation. Uh, we can check as well um, uh, if we calculating n times p which we'll actually use for the mean below n times p would be 50 times 0.86, which equals 43, which of course is also greater than 5. So we're ready to use the normal approximation to the binomial, and therefore we can say that the random variable x is approximately normally distributed with mu equal to np, which equals 43, as we just calculated, and sigma equals square root of np times 1 minus p, which equals the square root of 50 times 0.86 times 0.14, which to four sig figs rounds to 2.454. So therefore, we get the formula Z is approximately equal to X minus 43 over 2.454. So to finish this problem, what we want to do is we want we can say that we can convert the binomial to the normal, but we need to use the continuity correction. And we can see in the diagram below on the slide that we have the these there's a single the, in the histogram for the ran, the binomial random variable we can see that the rectangle for x equals 43 starts at 42.5 and ends at 43.5 so we apply that continuity correction so therefore the probability that x equals 43 binomial approximately equals the probability that x is between 42.5 and 43.5 normal which which equals probability that Z is between 42.5 minus 43 over 2.454 and 43.5 minus 43 over 2.454. That equals uh, to, that rounds to the probability that Z is between minus 0.20 and positive 0.20. And since those two numbers are just plus or minus the same value, we can invoke symmetry and let that equal to two times the phi value for uh, positive 0 0.20 minus 0 0.5, which rounds to 0 0.1586, which to the nearest percent is 16%. For part C, we want to calculate the probability that a sowing of 100 of these seeds will yield fewer than 80 sprouts. Now, since the normal approximation is valid for n equals 50, as we just found in part B, it must also be valid for any sample size larger than 50, which is the case here for n equals 100, and also is the case for the, the last part of this question where n equals 1,000. So we can use the normal approximation for, for the two remaining parts of this question. 
So we let x equal, once again, the number of tomato seeds that germinate, except this time out of 100 sowed. So that gives us x is approximately normally distributed with the mean of 100 times 0.86, which equals 86. And sigma equals square root of 100 times 0.86 times 0.14, which to four uh, sig figs equals 3.470. So therefore, z equals x minus 86 over 3.470. Now, we want to know the probability that x is less than 80. And that's the same as x being less than or equal to 79. And we want to make this conversion because we want to know what the last rectangle in the histogram is going to be. So, so we use the probability that x is less than or equal to 79, where 79 is the upper uppermost rectangle in the binomial histogram. So using the continuity correction, this rounds to the probability that x is less than or equal to 79.5 normal, which equals the probability that z is less than or equal to 79.5 minus 86 over 3.470, which rounds to the probability that z is less than or equal to minus 1.87, which as the diagram shows is equal to the phi value of minus 1.87, which rounds to 0 0.0307, or to the nearest percent, 3%. In part D, we're asked to redo this basically, except now we have a thousand seeds and we're, we're looking for the probability that a sowing of a thousand of these seeds will yield fewer than 800 sprouts. Now, it's worth noting here that the actual proportion that this corresponds to, in other words, the 800 over a thousand, is actually the same as what we uh, have for part C, which is 80 over 100. It, it, it just so happens that this would give us a sample proportion of 0 0.8 in both cases. So we go ahead and we, as we did for part C, we, we let x equal the number of tomato seeds that germinate, but this time out of 1,000. So, and we say that x is distributed approximately normally with the mean of um, 1,000 times 0 0.86, which equals 860. And sigma equals square root of 1,000 times 0.86 times 0.14, which to four sig figs equals 10.97. So z equals x minus 860 over 10.97. So a lot of this, the, 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 the method we use here is pretty much the same, um, same overall method that we used in part C. To get the probability that x is less than 800, we we convert that to the probability that x is less than or equal to 799, which, and this is binomial, so using the continuity correction, this is approximately equal to the probability that x is less than or equal to uh, 799.5 normal, which equals the probability that z is less than or equal to 799.5 minus 860 over 10.97, which rounds to the probability that z is less than or equal to minus 5.52, which is off the table. It's um, beyond uh, negative 3.99. So we, we know then that to four decimal places, the answer will be 0 0.0000, which rounds to 0% um, all the way to four decimal places. So we can say that uh, the, to the nearest percent, the answer is 0%. I hope that you found this video helpful. If you liked it and would like to see more from MRSA Campus, then please subscribe. And also, if you'd like to send your feedback, that's always welcome too. Thanks for watching, and I wish you well with your studies.